Next on Broadway Profiles, what a difference a year makes. Broadway stars bringing live music and dance back to New York City. We'll talk about the return of live theater. Plus, from Broadway to the blacklist, Tony winner LaChance is here to talk about her new character in the long-running TV crime drama. And another Tony nominee makes the leap to the small screen. Taylor Louderman talks about her role in the new comedy, Keenan. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is Broadway Profiles, presented by Broadway.com. So glad to have you with us. I'm Tamsin Fidel. Broadway will be back. We've been saying it for more than a year, but you know it's finally starting to feel like the momentum is building. A reason to feel hopeful for the first time in a long, long time. This is cool. This is what Times Square looked like exactly one year after Broadway went dark. A surprise concert with incredible live performances and appearances by some of the biggest names in our theater community. I think it's hugely important. I think everybody knows that more than ever now because it's not around. Uh, it's, it's where I work most of the time and, uh, and the whole city, like, it's the... Times Square is the center of the city and uh, it needs theater in it. For comparison, this is a creepy ghost town that was Times Square one year ago, but not anymore. Here's another taste of just how good Broadway can be in New York City. LaChance is a Tony Award winner known for performances such as The Color Purple and The Donna Summer Musical. But these days, you can catch her in primetime. She's currently featured in a multi-episode arc of one of my favorite shows, The Blacklist, on NBC. We had a chance to talk. What do you do? I'm a fugitive. Number one on the FBI's most wanted list. <laughs> one, huh? I would have gone with fourth. Now you're not just a stranger, you're a stranger with delusions of grandeur. Blacklist, you're getting a lot of response from people online, you know, seeing you, some people seeing you for the first time, even though I know and so many other people know how fabulous you have always been. I get these messages in my, um, I get direct messages from people in my uh, Instagram DMs and I, and people are saying, who are you? Uh, you're so beautiful. Are you gonna be on the show again? Is, how is James Spader to work with? Is he going to be your love interest? What's going on? What is your name? How can I find more about you? <laughs> and I'm like, listen, youngin, um, I've been around for a minute. So <laughs> the Blacklist audience is clearly a thriving, viable force. They are committed yep. to every week to, the, to what they care about these characters. And when they saw me come on that screen, they're like, who is this? So what's so funny is what, what people are thinking, their assumptions are, I'm either a killer, I'm gonna either kill James Spader, or I'm gonna make, or I'm gonna give him babies. It's like <laughs> one extreme or the other. <laughs> For your own sake, let this go. Is that some sort of threat? Well, you know, he's another one that has been in this industry for such a long time. My generation grew, you know, grew up with him. I, I yeah. remember him all, you know, in so many different films. He's just a class act in terms of a real, you know, a, a real actor. Oh, it's awesome. It's great to sit to uh, work with him, having had the opportunity to share a screen with him. He is very detailed actor, which is something that I appreciate because that's sort of how I work as well. I pay attention to all the details of the character and um, it helps you to live it more, to live in, to embody the character more truthfully when you have very specific details about the character. And he would, you know, give me a couple hints every now and then <clears throat> about things about my character on that show. And I'm just a bird watcher, but I thought it was really funny how he um, off screen would say, little, give me little nuggets. And I just really appreciate working with an actor like that.
join us. We talked about Black Theatre United as well the last time. Can you update everybody on that? Because I, I see things all the time in the news and the headlines. Yes, well, we are moving quite along. We just we are <clears throat> just launching our mentorship program. Okay. And all of the applications and everything is on our website for young artists, for young Black artists who are looking for a career in theater. We have, we have partnered with William Sound Festival and we have launched a mentorship program that we support. Because oftentimes a lot of Black students can't afford to live in cer certain cities to follow through an internship. And so we're offering support to some of these kids that may want to come in and uh, pursue a life in theater, not only on stage, off stage as well, yeah. for carpenters, for lighting designers, for directors, any production part of a theater, we're offering uh, scholarships for that program at Williamstown. Another one of our favorites has made the leap from the Broadway stage to primetime, right, Paul? Yes, indeed, Tamsin. Taylor Louderman is best known for originating the role of Queen Bee Regina George in Mean Girls, the musical. These days, you can see her starring alongside Kenan Thompson on the new NBC series, Kenan. <laughs> Our next guest today is a doula named Ellen Davis, here with her new book, Get This Thing Out of Me, Tips and Tricks for Your Best Birth. Kenan has been unreal, both Kenan Thompson, the individual, and the show, Kenan. Um, it's really been a dream come true because I was, I, I just fell in love with comedy ever since Kinky Boots and then, you know, Mean Girls, I just learned even more. Um, bringing it to the screen though is totally different. I'm grateful that I had people around me, you know, Kenan, uh, Chris Redd, Kim Ree, Don Johnson, all these people just being like, yeah, you're, this, you're killing it, you know, this is going well, which which was uh, helpful to hear that encouragement. I love your character, Tammy, who is the co-host on Wake Up With Kenan. She doesn't always say the smartest thing, but she's extremely sure of herself. It's like, she thinks she's on top of things, but what comes out of her mouth isn't always that, is it? Correct, yeah. She walks the line of being really good at her job and a complete mess, a complete disaster. And I love that about her. Uh, and she's not fully aware. In fact, I don't think she's aware at all of her downfalls there, which makes her delicious. And, uh, you know, that that energy of being on screen and having to keep it all together and, um, getting to see a little bit of a unraveling uh, when when she or Keenan <laughs> messes something up is so fun to play with as a, as a character. Now, I've read that your backup career was actually to be a TV reporter like Tammy. Is that true? Yeah, it's so funny. My mom reminded me of this when I got the part. She's like, you know, you used to tell me if you weren't gonna be a star on Broadway, you wanted to, um, be like a news reporter and I, I sure did. I have a girlfriend actually who's from my hometown who is a news reporter in St. Louis where I am, where I live. Um, and so I reached out to her and I was like, hey, can you send me any references on really uh, obnoxious, trying too hard uh, news reporters <laughs> that you know? And she sure did. Well, let's pretend you are a reporter and you just landed a big exclusive one-on-one -on -one with your co-star Don Johnson. What would be the number one question you would have to ask him? <laughs> well, I know he loves talking about Miami Vice and my grandmother loves hearing about it. So I would definitely start asking him about his days on Miami Vice. But I have to admit, I would have to do some research because I haven't seen it. <laughs> Let's go. You know, 10 years ago, you were starring in Bring It On, which is the musical that brought you to Broadway. And that was the first time I saw you. You were fantastic in that show. As you look forward now, what do your Broadway dreams look like? I think that my goals now um, are, are to just make sure I'm involved in a story that I want to tell. I, I, I'd love to grow up a little bit in Broadway, like not be a high schooler anymore. Um, not that I'm complaining by any means, <laughs> but um, I think it would be fun to tackle a more adult <laughs> role. <laughs> Theater couple Michael Yuri and Ryan Spawn have been together for more than a decade, but this year has been one like no other, especially for actors. 
We're featuring Michael and Ryan in this week's edition of Couples in Quarantine. H how has quarantine been for both of you? We go in phases. I mean, you know. I think we're both very, very grateful that early on we made the decision to stay here because I think a big part of it is both of us did not want to be uprooted during a time like this where we weren't in our actual home. You know, I feel like the people that stayed and we were you know, in the park or walking around or trying to get outside, everyone just had that, uh, I don't know that we said it to each other, but like, hey, thanks for thanks for just also being here and staying in New York and, and seeing it through, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, that's the thing about New York is you you know that, it, you know, they're not always friendly, but they've got your back. The period of time where you wanted, you really kept a distance from people on the street was sort of like going away and you're like, oh, that person's close to me, but they're masked. And I, I know they've made it this far. So like, you know, like they must be doing something right. And, and I know I'm doing something right. You just, you're just able to really trust New Yorkers. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about what you guys did um, with buyer and seller, because that was you know, a pretty incredible. We were sitting here thinking, well, well, if, if we were to do this, if there was a way to somehow stream a show from the apartment, and I do know this one person play, I have this solo act that I have done many, many times. We've worked together a lot before. We've, we've made some, uh, on camera projects and movies and web series. So like we know our way around a set. But specifically we also know our way around a set to, as a couple putting something together. And I think a lot of couples or people in, in quarantine together maybe didn't have that initial skill set. They learned it over the course of, of the pandemic. Yeah, we, we sort have... of launched in having already figured out how to work together. And we just did a, it was a lot of trial and error. And, and Ryan was here in the room and everybody else was like a voice in my head or, or you know, a voice in my ear or, or you know, like a, a little box on, the, on a computer. It was, it was crazy and extremely exciting. And then when it was over, you know, I took a bow, our cameras went off and it was quiet in here. And I walked over to Ryan and I was like, did it, did it work? When we did buyer and seller in April, we thought, we didn't think it was gonna be a year. We didn't think it was gonna be such a long, I mean, a, a year plus before there would be theater again. To see how how theater companies have found ways to, to, to stay to, to, to stay busy and to stay, yeah. and, to stay and, to, and to keep actors employed. And there have been so many exciting, um, exciting projects that have, have come around. Theater makers are by nature problem solvers. They, you know, like, just the nature of what it is we do. And so I think this was a specifically interesting challenge, not a permanent life, but uh, an interesting challenge to um, get us through this this time. It's not Jagged Little Pill is a winner of this year's Grammy for Best Musical Theater Album. Sharing the award are four of the show's principal stars, Katherine Gallagher, Lauren Patton, Celia Rose Gooding, and Elizabeth Stanley, as well as the show's producers and orchestrator Tom Kitt. We still have a lot more to talk about on this edition of Broadway Profiles. Coming up, it's one of the most bingeable shows of the pandemic, featuring some of the very best villains. Tony winner Janet McTeer is here to talk about her role in Ozark and a whole lot more. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is Broadway Profiles. We'll be right back. Janet McTeer is a Tony winner and an Olivier Award winner. She's also fresh off a Critics' Choice nomination for her performance in Ozark. McTeer plays Helen, the villainous attorney and fixer of the Navarro drug cartel. And no spoilers, but her role in the season three finale is shocking. And we had a chance to talk. Well, let's jump in and talk about it because you know, the last few things that I've seen you in, you are in, in that role that every woman I think wants to be, whether it's a villain role or not, uh, but incredibly a strong woman. Do you seem to gravitate toward those roles or do you look for them or do they just come to you? Both. I'm not sure I would know how to play somebody who wasn't strong, um, I think. And I'm not sure that I know many women who aren't. I mean, they're more or less all strong, just in different ways. I mean, we have to be, don't we? We have, don't have much choice. We moved here to start over. And it's been hard. 
Have you killed other people? Of we course do not. We not kill people. Okay, guys, that's it. Please, to school, learning. You do realize that you're betting everything on being able to pull this off. Yeah. I was arced. You know, I, I didn't know what to expect when it first when it first came out, and, and I you know, just get addicted to that show. And I, I just, I guess, I always love and look for shows that are just so different. So a lot of the themes are family, and uh, you know, how do you deal with your kids when you're a drug cartel launderer and you know how do you mess up your kids and how you know and like when my character comes into it for example in season three you then have the kind of um she how she deals with her family and how they deal how the birds deal with their family and how different that is and how do you how do you how do you do it it's the women who kind of come up you know that you have these great female parts of these women who slowly but surely take it on up. Are you looking forward to getting back on stage when we can safely? I have this very strange double thing, to be honest. I mean, I would love to get back to the stage and do the, their opening. Really? Okay, where's the boss? I would be, you know, I'd love that. On the other hand, I go, no, don't employ us. Employ all the young actors who haven't had a job and who haven't had any money and can't afford to live and, you know, haven't even started their careers. Let's just, just, just get them. Do a thousand plays with young people. I'm fine. I've been doing this for years. I'll come back the year after when they've all had a job. Coming up, he was one of the breakout stars of Disney's Frozen, and now he's on TV in the Walking Dead universe. You'll get to know Jelani Aladdin. This is Broadway Profiles. We'll be back in just a few. When live theater returns, the Frozen National Tour will be headed to a city near you. And one of the standout stars of the Broadway cast was Jelani Aladdin. He played Kristoff. But these days, you can see him on TV in The Walking Dead World Beyond. We talked to him about breaking barriers in theater and why his role in Frozen was so important. He's this week's Fresh Face. First of all, so I started off with track and lacrosse. I do want to play football in the fall. So I decided to audition for the freshman sophomore musical. I did it and then I got to play the role of the cat in the hat in Susical. I absolutely loved it and hated it at the same time. I thought it was so much work, but it's so fun. And so I was never going to do it again. I was going to quit. And then uh, one of my best friend's mom was like, you can't give this up. You can't. You have something special. So I auditioned for the next one and the next one and the next one and the next one. And then finally, around uh, junior year of high school, I was like, I want to do this for the rest of my life. I want to be an actor. I think making my Broadway debut has been an incredible joy, an incredible honor, an incredible privilege um, to kind of take this character, Kristoff, that people know and love and that they've come to respect and bring myself into it and bring some new things to it and, and really try to deepen who he is and why he's necessary to the story and, and how he's transformed because of these two princesses. It's empowering. A black young man never would have been like, oh, I could play Kristoff in Frozen until now. And for me, that is a chance for children to now see themselves reflected in this piece that they didn't think they were possibly could be a part of. It's an incredible honor. We'll be right back. For the latest Broadway news and buzz, let's go ahead and send it over to Broadway.com's editor-in-chief, Paul Von Torek. Hi, Tamsin. Some stage favorites have landed on the list of 2021 Oscar nominees. But ask you to go easy on me, baby doll. Big congrats to Leslie Odom Jr., the Tony-winning Hamilton star, who is double nominated. He's up for Best Supporting Actor for his performance as singer Sam Cooke in One Night in Miami. Can you hear the angels sing low? Speak now. He's also nominated in the original song category for his composition, Speak Now, from the same film. The Netflix adaptation of August Wilson's Ma Rainey's Black Bottom received five nominations. Where's the, uh, the horn player? That includes nods for leading lady Viola Davis and the late Chadwick Boseman. Davis made history with this year's achievement, becoming the most honored black actress in Oscar history with a total of four nominations and one win. Meanwhile, another Broadway favorite, Glenn Close, is up for her eighth time this year for Hillbilly Elegy. After the success of Ma Rainey, Hollywood has to be pretty excited that Denzel Washington 
has committed himself to producing film adaptations of all of August Wilson's plays. Next up is the 1990 hit The Piano Lesson, a family drama set in 1930s Pittsburgh, which will star Samuel L. Jackson, Daniel Brooks, and Denzel's son, John David Washington. Before heading to the screen, the same cast will perform the play on Broadway in 2022. That's it for me. Back to you, Tamsin. And that's going to do it for us. Until next week, I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is Broadway Profiles.